Her husband was a very lucky man. <laughs> so let's begin with word perfect. Just now, Heavenly Father, we, we come to you hopefully with open hearts and open minds. I pray that you may give me the words to speak, that you may be pleased. I pray that those that receive your word, Heavenly Father, this truly may be a day of decision. Your Son's sweet and precious power for me, I pray. Amen. Once again, it's my privilege and my honor to be able to come and present God's word. And I just started to go hand in pocket, and I know my dad was looking at me. So I yanked it out real quick, and he reminded me last time, get your hands out of your pocket. <laughs> I was going to stuff them full of stuff, Dad. And then I figured people would talk about them, so I'll just keep my hands out. I was standing in a reception line at the funeral, uh, taking my turn to go up front to talk, uh, to express my condolences to families. And I heard one of the family members speak to the lady that was standing in front of me. She said this sorrowfully, sorrowfully and she said it with, with remorse. She said in a shameful manner that she was mad at God. She said it in such a fashion, I'm sure, because I know her to be a Christian woman. Have you ever been mad at God? Are you mad at God? Those times you know when life is just not fair, when it's one disappointment right after another. Maybe you got mad or maybe you are mad at the maker due to a loss. Perhaps the death of a spouse a parent, or heaven forbid, a, a child. Or perhaps you're mad at Him because one of your kids is a screw-up. You did everything you could to raise them upright. You took them to church. You taught them to pray. But yet it doesn't seem like it's stuck. It doesn't seem like it's took a hold of them. Or perhaps it's that sickness, that disease that has crippled a loved one or yourself, that birth defect, that cancer or that disability. Or perhaps it's that cheating spouse or that cruel boss, that lying company or that lying union. You bust your gut day in and day out. You follow all the rules, you go to church, you tithe. <coughs> You've crossed all the religious T's and dotted all the religious I's. Nothing gets better. Cheaters win. You fail. Evil prevails and good is trampled underfoot. Why, God? Why, why, why? I don't necessarily guess being mad at God's sin. It can lead to sin. It can lead to a dead faith. And it's something that you've got to deal with before you go to bed at night. But I would be willing to bet that most of us here have been faced with that and have been challenged with that. And if you haven't, you perhaps will be one day. But why? Today I want to you know, talk briefly, and when I say briefly, who knows, it might last 10 minutes or it may last a half an hour, I don't know. But I want to talk a little bit about the whites. This is, not a, a, this is not a sermon or a message about why good things or bad things happen to good people. But when we think about this why, perhaps one of the reasons why is that we have a distorted picture of who God is. You know, we have the God of the Old Testament, and then we've got the God of the New Testament. 
Is it not the same God? We think of this God of Old Testament as big man. The one that has killed people for touching the Ark of the Covenant in a wrong manner. And then we think of God in the New Testament. Oh, the God of love. Folks, it's the same God. Or perhaps we think of God as some type of a cosmic Santa Claus and it's put here to make us happy. Because isn't that what it's really all about? Us being happy? <clears throat> hmm. Seems like at times we have forgotten who is to be served and who the server is. We have forgotten why man was created. It was for the Creator. We have turned God, big G, into God, little g. Perhaps we need to heed the words of God as He spoke to Job. Job, the 38th chapter, verses 1 through 4. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. Hmm. God was making a clear point to Job of who the Creator is and who is in control and who is not in control. Or look at the discourse between God and Jonah. We remember Jonah. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Jonah did everything he could to get out of going to Nineveh. He didn't like those people in Nineveh. And to be honest with you, he just sent them all go to hell. But God finally, after having swallowed by a whale, got him there and he preached God's word. And guess what? Instead of going to hell, they all repented. And he got mad at God. God said to Joan, Is it right? For you to be angry. <clears throat> Simply said, who are you or I to be angry with the Almighty God? But then let's look at it maybe in a little different way. In Matthew, the fifth chapter, starting with verse 44. Within these verses, there is something that sometimes we forget. This is Jesus doing the speaking. He says, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Look at that little part in verse 45 where He says, He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good. And He allows it to rain on the evil and the good. Bad things and good things happen to both. The good as well as the evil. Sometimes we've been lulled into believing that as long as you're a Christian, nothing bad is supposed to happen to you. And if it does, you must not be a good Christian that is farther from the truth. At the same time, we have a God that fully understands pain and He understands suffering. Listen to how the prophet Isaiah described our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He says, He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as if our if it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs 
and carried our sorrows. Yet we did not esteem Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Man of suffering. Man of sorrows. <coughs> then remember His friend Lazarus? His weeping and the loss of a beloved one. And we'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. Perhaps His awareness and His concern for us in understanding what we go through here in this life with the pain and sorrow is best summed up in the book of Revelations. In Revelations, the 22nd, 21st chapter, starting with verse 3 through 7, a rather lengthy passage, but I think to get the whole picture, you need the whole picture. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, this is uh, the Apostle John, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And He will dwell with them. They will be His people. And God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on a throne says, I am making everything anew. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this. And I will be their God. And they will be my children. See, we have a Heavenly Father that knows what we go through here. And He knows what we're going to need when we get home. Or perhaps... Our anger towards God is due to a distorted picture of who we are and what that means. <coughs> God's Word tells us that we are a peculiar people. People say that about me every day. You sure are peculiar. But as Christians, we are a peculiar lot. We are called to be different. We are called to be set apart. We are called to be holy, which means to be set apart. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, Since you call on a Father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. See, we don't belong here. We're just a visiting. We're just a passing through. And we best remember that. Because as Peter wrote, to live out your lives as foreigners in reverent fear, the reverent fear is due to the cost that His Son paid on Calvary's cross. Remember, His Son shed His blood, gave up His life, so that we can have eternal life and have a new home. Or sometimes, perhaps, we have forgotten that there's a cost to be a disciple of His. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning them to them, He said, If anyone comes to Me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers or sisters, Yes, even their own lives, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you all want to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and you aren't able to finish it, Everybody who sees it would ridicule you saying, this person began to build but wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? 
If he is not, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. You and I may suffer and we may suffer greatly for the cause of Christ. Some may, due to our faith, due to our desire to please God before pleasing ourselves, we need to always be aware of false prophets that preach happiness in this world as a sign that you are in His graces. Beware of those that promise health and wealth if you follow Him. We must learn to be content in each and every situation. And yes, I know that it's so much easier to say and very hard to do. The Apostle Paul talking to Timothy said this, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Or perhaps we have a distorted picture as it pertains to what His plans are for us. Just what is His plan for you? What's His plan for me? Simply, and very simply put, His plan is to get us home. And how so important it is that we stay focused. He told His disciples in John chapter 14, a passage of Scripture that sadly, all so sadly, we hear at funerals. But it's a message that needs to be preached to the living. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in Me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with Me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. See, God has great things in store for you and me, but they're not here. The Apostle Peter once again remind us that our inheritance is not here. If my parents die, well, Dad's already said he'd leave nothing for me, so I guess it'll all be spent. And, and that's fine too. It's not mine. The Apostle Peter talked about it, talked about our inheritance. And he said, Your inheritance is not here. It's not here. Your inheritance is kept for you in heaven. <clears throat> but we live so much as if it's here. And it's not. It's up there. And that's where it's kept for us. He prayed this right before His death. And when He prayed this, He had us in mind. This is, I think this is the longest recording, recorded prayer that we have from Jesus. Shortly after he would be led to the cross. He says in John chapter 17, and I'll pick up in verse 20. He says, My prayer is for not is not for them alone. See, he just got done praying for his disciples, praying for his apostles, because he knew what they were going to be going through at the time that he died. He knew what they were going to be going through the days after His resurrection and His ascension. And He prayed in earnest for them. But the prayer changed. And now He's praying for us. I pray also for those who will believe in Me through their message. And that's us. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, 
May they also be in us so that the world may believe that You have sent Me. I have given them the glory that You gave Me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, You in Me. So if they are brought to complete unity, then the world will know that You have sent Me and have loved them even as You have loved Me. Listen to verse 24. Father, I want those You have given to Me to be with Me where I am and to see My glory and the glory You have given Me because You loved Me before the creation of the world. God wants us home. And He wants as many of us that whosoever will may come. But He also tells us sometimes we've got to be patient. Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. James writes, See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crops patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains, you too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. And then you know what? Once we get home, it will become clear things will make sense. I've read this passage and I've heard this passage several, several times. And I never really grasped what it was about. Because it's in the love chapter of the Bible, 1 Corinthians 13. But I attended a funeral for a good Christian woman. And I heard the minister use this section. And I had to how come? And then it clicked exactly what the Apostle Paul was saying. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I become a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we only see a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. He's talking about being home. He's talking about being in glory. He's talking about being with God and being with Jesus. And we'll understand it. It'll make sense. We'll be able to see clearly what now we just look through a pair of dirty glasses. <coughs> and so oftentimes we don't understand. See, getting home is what it's all about. We must learn to cast all our cares, to cast all our concerns, to cast all of our anxieties upon Him. See, some of us, well, we'll have a rough trip. Full of bumps, full of potholes, and full of crashes. And sadly for some, this trip will be short. Sometimes, very, very short. For others, it may be a rather smooth ride, but it also seems so long that it never is going to end. But we will all take the trip. Your relationship with God will dictate your final destination. Let us pray. Just now, Heavenly Father, we pray. We pray a prayer of thanksgiving. As we are so fortunate. We are so blessed. We are so happy to know 
what lies ahead for us. We just pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll strengthen us on this journey. That you may increase our faith. That you may solidify our hope. Because we all long to get home. We know it's tough. But we are assured that you also know it's tough. So please walk with us. And we ask at times that we can't walk, that you'll carry us. We pray just now for those ones, Heavenly Father, that don't have a guarantee. This may be their time of decision. In your such sweet and precious, powerful name, I pray. Please stand as you sing.